Okay. Well, you know, the first thing I, I want to share with you is the fact that the information that I talk about, the science, the truth is available to you. It's available to you. You just have to take the trouble to uh, to look it up, to understand it. This, this has to be as important as you buying a refrigerator or buying a new car, whether or not you or your spouse or your children are healthy or sick or survive or don't. And it uh, demands that you get involved. And getting involved uh, means having access to the scientific literature. Now, most of the scientific literature, at least half of it is available open access when you go to the National Library of Medicine or just go to Google. Uh, you'll find that most of the studies I talk about are available to you, but uh, oh, somewhere fewer than half aren't available to you because the publisher wants to make a fee. So they charge you 30 or $40 an article. Well, this can get old real fast, even for me. And uh, the way I've answered that is I've become a professor at various medical schools during my years of practice. And right now I'm an assistant clinical professor at, at least two and maybe as many as four medical schools. And that gives me access to their medical library where they have subscriptions to most of the journals and they can get me the articles. Well, that's good, but they can't get me all the articles. And some of the articles that I can't get from the library, or it's just inconvenient to get from the medical library, I go to the website that you see here on your right. And I want you to take advantage of it. It's, it's a renegade website in the sense that the publishers don't want you to know about this. Whether it's legal or not legal, well, that's in some ways irrelevant because you pay for most of the scientific studies that are out there, either as a consumer buying products or through your tax dollars. This is your, your information, your research. And you can access this by going through sci-hub dot, whatever the, the country that houses this particular um, internet is. Like in this case, uh, it's available through sci-hub.ru, which stands for Russia. But it may change, and you just need to go to Sci-Hub and find out where they're hosting the site at that particular time. And then what you do is you put in where it says enter reference, you put the DOI number. That's the best way to find it. You'll find the DOI number listed when you go to PubMed. And then you just paste that in there and go open. And then once you have it open, uh, it's readable, but you can't have it for your own until you save it. So you have to save it to your computer. And then it's a PDF file that you can edit. You know, it's just there and available. So this is for you. This is for you to check whether or not I'm telling you the truth or exaggerating. And of course, you could check on some of the other guests that JJ has. And, and when you have questions about your health, diet, go here, get the research, find out what the truth is. All right. The other thing I'd like you to know is uh, is how I think about myself and my credits. And you know, I'm the co-founder, along with my best friend and marital partner for 50, well, 51 years now with Mary. And I'm the co-founder of the McDougal program. I'm also the co-founder of Dr. McDougal's Right Foods. And Mary wasn't the, the other founder in this. This involved a, a, another friend of mine. And we developed this company in the early 90s. And Dr. McDougal's Right Foods are in over 6,000 stores in the United States. And, and when I say stores, I don't mean just stores. They're in hospital cafeterias. And when you go to your ski resort and you take a break from skiing, you'll find them in the cafeterias. They're there every place. Dr. McDougal's Right Foods. And we've been in business for 20 years now. It's not usual that a company keeps products on the shelves for 20 years. Why? Have we succeeded? Well, because these taste great. It's not Dr. McDougall's perfect foods, by the way. It's Dr. McDougall's right foods, which means it has no animals, no animals of any kind. That includes secretions of animals like dairy or eggs, none. And it has no added oil. Uh, other than that, it has a bit of salt, a bit of spice, a bit of enjoyment, because we know that you won't eat salt-free food. So we'll give you a little bit of a little salt, not much, not much compared to other products. So that's Dr. McDougall's Right Foods, which I'm very proud of. And we've had a company that's lasted for 20 years. Co-founder of uh, McDougall Adventures, which we haven't done in a while since, uh, since COVID-19. And that's because of the difficulty traveling and staying at various resorts. And 
you know, there's a little relief from that these days. So who knows? We might uh, we might start uh, McDougal Adventures Incorporated again and take you to wonderful places like Hawaii or South America or Central America and all kinds of wonderful destinations. We used to take between 80 and 150 people uh, twice a year. I, I'm also the co-author of uh, 13 national best-selling books. And uh, Mary sh shares the authorship with the, me on most of these books. Uh, probably most important these days is I'm the father of three successful children. And I'm the grandfather of seven grandchildren, which is, if you're a grand grandparent, you know what I'm talking about. It's been a long career. It's been, uh, it's been over 50 years that I've been in this business. And uh, it's been 47 years since I practiced diet therapy. In uh, my early stages of uh, development of the McDougall program, Atkins dominated. Uh, he was the thing. It was low carb diets, bacon, butter, and cheese. That was the Atkins diet. And uh, it was very popular back then. And then I came on the scene and I was on many shows, including Larry King and uh, many of the big internet shows. And, and my books became national bestsellers. I was on the New York Times national bestselling list. And and I, I did well, I dominated the market. And um, actually my agent, Mike Cohen, uh, he, he also was the agent for Robert Atkins. And he used to tell me, say, you know, no matter what I do, I can't sell a Robert Atkins book. All I can sell is your books. And I was real happy about that. Well, in the year 2000, I'd have to say that Atkins came back and we kind of shared the stage. And we did the great nutrition debate in the year 2000, where we, uh, gave a presentation, a panel presentation in front of 500 cameras in Washington, DC. Thousands and millions of people watched that. It's still up on the internet, the great nutrition debate. And I would say at that time, we pretty much uh, shared uh, the, the consumer base. And then what happened is uh, shortly after that, my editors from Pentagon Putnam came to me and they said, you know, McDougal, we really like you. I mean, you, in, in sales of books, you're like 5% of the company. So we, we're, we think you're important. But what you know is that uh, you got to change. you you got to change because the, the interest in nutrition is changing drastically. Low-carb diets are what are going to be popular and sell books. And so they insisted that I start writing Atkins-type books. And I said to my editor, Michael Hamilton, I said, I'm not going to do this. You know, you think I do this just to make money? I said, I really believe in what I'm doing. Plus, the scientific literature is absolutely consistent and clear that these diets are dangerous and that the high carbohydrate starch based diet I teach is the truth. And I, I kept with what I told my editor. And unfortunately, uh, I was no longer a national best-selling author. And the Atkins diet came back, the low-carb diets in several forms, zone diet, the grain brain diet, you know, uh, several forms it came back in. And, and now we've evolved to the point where Atkins is kind of pushed to the back and we have the keto diets, which are a variation of a low-carb diet. You put you into ketosis and we're going to talk about those. But what I want to tell you is things are changing rapidly all over the world. Uh, you know, we have huge changes in politics that are going on, uh, huge changes in economics that are going on. You know, some of them are pretty scary to tell you the truth. And they, the changes are taking place at a rapid, a rapid pace because of our ability to communicate. It, it, estimates are that 86% of people around the world have access through micro devices, through computers, through iPhones, iPads, to information from others, 86% of people, so you can share an idea. And this leads me to believe, and I have seen it happening, that the truth is going to win out. The liars, polluters, and the liars, polluters, and cheaters are going to lose because the truth will reign. And you have access to that truth in terms of the Sci-Hub website. I'm really optimistic. I'm really excited for, for the first time in a long time. Uh, it's been a, a tough road to say the least that I've been fighting on. And, and I, I can see where the, the truth of a, the correct diet for a human being is gonna get out there. And people are going to be eating what I call a starch-based diet, not just for themselves, but for planet earth. 
Well, with that introduction, uh, I would uh, like to start the presentation on hunger. Hunger, hunger. You know, I mean, I don't know how often you think about hunger, maybe every minute, you know, once a day, once a week, once a month. I don't know, but it's always there. It's an unbeatable friend. It keeps you alive. We're going to talk about this drive, and we're going to talk about why diets, drugs, and surgeries fail because they don't really deal with hunger properly. Hunger a blinding drive for survival, reminding us that food should be sought and eaten. But it's a losing battle for 80% of people. 80% you know, of people in Western countries are either overweight or obese. To win with a hunger drive, you just have to get it in. You know, if you want to get this all solved, you have to, you have to treat this drive and you have to answer it. When you're hungry, you can't think about anything else. And a statement I'm going to make over and over again during this presentation is a hungry person sees only food. Nothing else is on your mind. This is the kind of discussion that I'm going to have with you right now, but I think all your physicians should have if they're interested in you getting truly well. And they're, if they're interested in just managing you, which is what the medical practice of today is, it just manages your care, changing from one brand of drug to another. Uh, cure is not, is not part of the medical practice. And I know you as consumers, you're interested in cure, but not being managed. You'd like to solve your problems, get on with your life. I want to talk to you about the Minnesota, Minnesota starvation experiment. This was uh, done in 1944 during uh, World War II. During World War II, we had, had massive starvation in Western Europe. And of course, it's gone on in many places of the world, but it was really important to us in the United States uh, during World War II. You see a picture of Dutch children eating soup during the famine. And you know, Mary was surprised when she found out that you could survive on tulip bulbs, which is uh, what they had to do out of desperation. You look at the 16 most common famine foods. Their food's on the McDougal diet. You don't see any milk or cheese or meat or chicken. They're eating a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. That's what they ate during famine times. Why? They were the most energetic, healthiest, and most accessible foods. Well, the, uh, some of the people in the United States noticed about the hunger and suffering that went on in Western Europe. And as a result, uh, one important scientist, Ansel Keys, decided to do an experiment to study hunger. And so he set up the uh, Minnesota starvation experiment, which of course was done in Minnesota. And they had an ad out to recruit people and 400 people answered to this ad. The ad was, will you starve that they may be better fed? And out of those 400 people, they picked 36 conscientious objectors. You know, these were men who didn't want to go to battle, but still wanted to serve their country. And so they volunteered for this 11-month experiment, which fed them a diet that was uh, similar to what you would eat in, in the famines in Europe. It was 25% protein, 17% fat, low fat, 58% carbohydrate. So it was an 11-month uh, experiment at the University of Minnesota, and the men were to lose 25% of their normal body weight. And here's how the 11 months went. For the first three months, they ate a normal diet, which was 3,200 calories a day. Then they went on a period of semi-starvation. Semi-starvation, this is important for you to, to understand what they're, they're talking about, is they cut their calorie intake in half to 1,570 calories a day. Now, the reason it's important is during semi-starvation, you still are uh, dealing with normal metabolism, with glycolysis. You're not into ketosis. To get into ketosis, which we're gonna talk about, you have to take in fewer than 600 calories a day. So they starved these men for six months and they lost 25% of their body weight. You know, uh, some of them lost as much as 50 pounds. And they didn't start out overweight. You see a picture of these 36 conscientious objectors. And the kind of foods that they fed them, as I mentioned, were similar to what people would eat in the famine in Western Europe and potatoes and turnips and rutabagas and bread and macaroni, all a high carb diet. 
but they did get enough food to not put themselves into ketosis. In other words, they suffered hunger and starvation. During the last part of this experiment, uh, for three months during the last part, uh, they were refed, carefully refed, except for 12, 12 men. 12 men went through a uh, experimental design where they're allowed to eat as much food as they wanted, unrestricted, whereas the other men were kept at two to 3,000 calories a day. Ansel Keys, a very, very famous uh, medical doctor and scientist, some of you may be familiar with K rations, K rations, which was the food uh, carried by soldiers. And um, he did the seven country study ex uh, experiment. He's an extremely well respected scientist. Uh, some of the things that the men described about uh, the time they spent during starvation during this six months, and I'd like to read them to you. Uh, I, th I think it comes across well by reading them, even though I don't like to read my own slides. So let's, let's take a look at some of the things, some of the comments that were made about this period of time. Uh, food and e eating became uh, focal points in conversation, reading, dreams, and even daydreams. A hungry person can only think about food. Men watched movies about food, developed habits of reading cookbooks and uh, collecting uh, various food-related items. They guarded their food defensively with their elbows. You can imagine them sitting at the dinner table next to one of their fellow, uh, their fellow uh, subjects in the experiment, and they would use their elbows to make sure they didn't get any of their food. They would eat the last crumb and even lick their plates. Some even became upset with non-participants in the cafeteria if they wasted food. Uh, participants rapidly chewed two to three sticks of gum at a time until their mouths became sore just to relieve some of the hunger. The men collected uh, food themes, food themed items, and some even rubbished through garbage to find food. They started toying with their food, cutting it into small pieces, making meals last longer. They increased the use of uh, spices and salt to add flavor to the meals. And they became isolated and described themselves as feeling socially inadequate. Volunteers felt a decrease in sex drive and all interest in women and dating was lost. Symptoms of anxiety and depression became common. They suffered gastrointestinal disturbances, headaches, decreased need for sleep, extreme tiredness, cold intolerance, and muscle soreness. Physical changes included sunken faces and bellies, hair loss, protruding rims, ribs, uh, edema, swollen legs, ankles, and faces, and some lost 50 pounds, 33% of their pre-experiment weight. These men were hungry, a hungry person thinks only about food. Interesting, uh, after the experiment, or during the experiment and afterwards, uh, they favored eating potatoes because they found that potatoes were most satisfying, it became their favorite food. And you see the reason why in uh, satiety in text, which was uh, an experiment performed by Susan Holt. Uh, what, what they found is that potatoes are the most satisfying of all foods. They're twice as satisfying as meat and dairy and the high sugary desserts are seven times as satisfying. Potatoes. They suffered from a high fat hyperphagia, which they, they said appears to be largely due to the inability of the body to rapidly detect the high energy density of fatty foods. We're gonna talk about that. During the uh, final months of the experiment, when they were refeeding them, uh, 12 men joined a, uh, a special aspect of the experiment where they were encouraged to eat as much food as they wanted. And something interesting happened. You can see that, uh, that their uh, calorie intake decreased drastically and their fat mass decreased drastically. See, FM decides for, just, uh, stands for fat mass. And their free fatty mass decreased somewhat. Free fatty mass would be the uh, organs such as the liver and the spleen and the muscles. 
Uh, that's the free fatty mass. And it decreased a bit, little bit. And what they found is that uh, during the refeeding, the fatty mass increased. In fact, it increased to the point where they became more fatty, their body appearance became more fatty than prior to the experiment. They gained about 10% more body weight, which was fat, than they'd started out prior to the beginning of the experiment. And it was due to hyperphagia, hyperphagia. In other words, excessive eating. And they overshot their set point. Their set point was, was the uh, body weight that people have. And we're going to talk about set point. The body weight that people have naturally and normally and that they maintain. They overshot their uh, set point and they accumulated an extra amount of body fat. And they only stopped this hyperphagia when they, uh, they, when they repopulated their free fatty mass, when the size of their organs, so like their muscles and spleen and liver, regained their normal size. They didn't stop the hyperphagia uh, by losing the extra body fat. They had, to, they had to have healthier organs. And the other thing I want to point out is, unless they gave enough calories, extra protein, vitamins, and minerals had little, do, little to do with the hyperphagia or recovery from the hyperphagia. Now, the reason this is important is because people complain that uh, they overeat. I hear this quite often. Oh, you don't understand me, doc. I, I, I'm an overeater. Uh, you, you put down any kind of food in front of me and I'll gain weight on it. Of course, I've challenged these people over the years. They've been my patients. And you know, I tell them, okay, let's just see whether you're an overeater, whether you've gained excessive weight. Here's a bushel basket full of potatoes. Why don't you eat that every day and see what happens? See whether you gain weight or not. I've never had anybody who took up the challenge gain any extra weight. So what I think that these people are suffering from, and there are people who accumulate more body fat than they ought to, is that they have suffered from hyperphagia. Just like the men in this experiment, they, had re they remembered the pain of hunger. Now, in this case, uh, the pain of hunger came as a result of dieting and, and suffering hunger because they restricted food, you know, common diets, por portion control. And, and they developed a fear of being hungry. Uh, food insecurity. And as a result, they're eating a lot of extra food because they don't want to starve in the future. They want to put a reserve on. And uh, those people who tell me that they overeat, I don't understand them. I'm getting to understand you a little bit. I, I'm starting to understand what you've been through. But this distorted relationship you have with food, your distrust of your body, that you don't believe that your hunger drive will properly take care of you, this disappears in time. And having the experience that eating the right kind of foods does not cause you to gain weight. You can't put on extra weight if you follow the right kind of diet. Now, there have been diet books written which tell you that dieting is going to make you fat. And it begins by the understanding that 80 to 95% of dieters gain back the weight they work so hard to lose. Why diets make us fat? Well, the reason diets make us fat, you can learn from the Minnesota starvation experiment for, through the phase where these 12 men were for eight weeks allowed to eat as much as they wanted because they'd gone through 10 months of pain, of starvation, the lingering insecurity from the food caused them to eat so much extra. So I do believe when you tell me that you can be an overeater, but I know why. It's because of all the punishment you've gone through all the years trying to get yourself down to trim body weight by being hungry. So we don't want to do that. A hunger drive is satisfied uh, normally and naturally by starches. You know, just like I talked to you about the two diets, the diets of people who are suffering from famine in Europe, and the diets of these uh, 36 conscientious objectors during 11 months during the starvation experiment. 
Starch is what you eat to satisfy the hunger drive. Now, why do we know this? Well, well, we've done experiments and there are a couple of kinds of experiments that show you that starches satisfy hunger. Let's take a look at the first kind of experiment that's done that shows that carbohydrate suppresses the hunger drive, satisfies the hunger drive, whereas fat does not. Uh, if we look at this uh, particular graph here on the left, uh, what you see is something called a hunger rating. In other words, uh, how hungry do you feel? And, and they give you a, a questionnaire, which is down at the bottom of the chart. You know, I'm extremely hungry. I'm hungry, semi-hungry, uh, no particular feeling, uh, semi-satisfied, satisfied, or extremely full. And they answer the investigators, how do you feel after a meal? And what they find is when you feed high fat meals, which is represented by the solid line, it's essentially the same as when you ate a quote, normal diet. Uh, what uh, they found is fat supplements produce no detectable action on measures of appetite at any point. You don't even notice the fat that you eat. It doesn't register. If you look at the carbohydrate line, you see that the satisfaction rating is, is uh, much better. They were less hungry. Okay, the other way they do experiments is this, is you'll, you'll feed a test meal. It'll be, uh, and this is the next, next chart over, the test meal. They'll uh, either feed a normal breakfast, and then they'll give you free access to a snack. And they determine how much you eat after a normal breakfast. And so they fed them three different kinds of breakfast of, uh, of breakfasts. Uh, one was a normal breakfast, you know, a typical American diet. One was a very high fat breakfast to see how much snack they took in. And what they did is taken in a very large amount of snack afterwards because they were still hungry. And then they fed in the third bar after a test meal that was high in carbohydrate, they allowed them free access to the snacks and they'd taken uh, much less food. Again, showing you that carbohydrate satisfies the hunger drive. And your body doesn't even notice the fat you eat. Carbohydrate, you know, starches, beans, corn, potatoes, rice, wheat, breads, pastas, sweet potatoes, starches. The other interesting experiment that shows this is one where they took uh, volunteers and they put them in a, a, a medical ward, a, a nutrition ward, where they, they house them and they prepare them all the food. And uh, they had the opportunity to make foods that would disguise the amount of fat in them. Like for example, soups or breads or muffins or sandwiches and stews and so on. You could hide the fat. They could put in mayonnaise, vegetable oil, creams, butters, et cetera. They could put it in the food and the, and the participants wouldn't even notice it. They, could, they couldn't tell which were high fat or low fat. And so uh, secretively, they, they changed the amount of fat in the food. And then they allowed these participants to spontaneously eat as much as they wanted. And what you see is when they fed them a high fat version of the muffins and stews and soups, 45 to 50% of the meal was fat. They took in 2,700 calories. When, when they cut down on the fat in the food, uh, say to 30 to 35%, they took in 300 fewer calories. They took in 2,400 calories. And then when they fed them a low fat version, in other words, they left out most of the butter and mayonnaise and vegetable oil. And they fed them a diet that was 15 to 20% fat. By the way, the McDougal diet is only 7% fat. They took in 600 fewer calories without even noticing spontaneously, no suffering, no hunger, nothing. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. And ladies and gentlemen, you need to get this. Carbohydrate satisfies the hunger drive. It's designed that way. Scientific experiments show that it works that way. This is without any controversy at all. Now you'll hear people on low carbohydrates diets tell you that, that people don't have a, a strong appetite. Yeah, but why? Not because they're satisfying the hunger drive. We'll get to that in just a minute. Let's take a look at uh, various kinds of foods and uh, see what they provide in terms of satisfying the hunger drive. The, the first thing that satisfies the hunger drive is bulk. Uh, bulk satisfies the hunger drive. And 
uh, you've seen this. Some of you have tried uh, uh, programs that involve, say, fiber pills. And you filled up the stomach with these fiber pills and you know, your stomach felt full, but you got hungry right away because you didn't really get uh, what we call central satisfaction, systemic satisfaction. And if you look at the filling capacity of various foods, you'll see what the fulfilling capacity is and how this initial phase of satisfying the hunger drive occurs. But this is just a mechanical filling that takes place. This is a local sensation. Look at uh, 500 calories of food in each of these beakers, which represents the size of your stomach. You know, 500 calories of butter or vegetable oil or salad dressing barely fills the stomach. You're ravenously hungry. You've hardly done anything to filling that stomach up. Cheese and meat, maybe a third of the stomach you fill up. Not much, not much. And then you get over to rice, almost fills the whole stomach. 500 calories, these are all 500 calories. You move on to corn, fills the whole stomach. And when it comes to potatoes, there wasn't enough room to put 500 calories of potatoes in my beaker. If you look at calories per gram, which is another way of looking at this, uh, this picture, you know, oils are very concentrated calories. They're nine calories per gram. Calorie dense. Meat and dairy is four calories per gram. Now, you may have learned that sugar is four calories per gram, too, and you may have gotten confused. You may think that what we feed people is sugar and it's four calories per gram. No, we don't feed table sugar to people as the main component of the diet. We feed like potatoes that have sugar in them with a lot of water and a lot of fiber, which have no calories. And so what it turns out is your starches are really about one calorie per gram, and potatoes are even fewer than one calorie per gram. But this is just temporary, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so let's see if I still have you here. Do I still have you on screen share? Uh, yes, we're, we still have screen share, Dr. McDougall. You're not able to share right now? Are you able to see it now? Oh, yes, I am, the beakers. I see the different beakers. Okay, good. I have a little glitch here on my computer. All right, let's take a look at uh, this from another point of view. Again, each of these speakers contains uh, 500 calories. And we're talking about systemic or central satisfaction, the satisfaction that counts for hours after you eat. And this is accomplished by carbohydrate. I just showed you in the experiments that it's carbohydrate that satisfies the hunger drive. And so you look at the percent of calories that are carbohydrate in these various speakers that contain 500 calories. There's no carbohydrate in butter or vegetable oil or salad dressing, cheese, no carbohydrate, meat, zero, egg, zero. Whereas when you get over to the starches like rice, 88% of the calories are carbohydrate, corn, 86%, and potatoes, 90% carbohydrate. This is what satisfies you is the rice, the corn and the potatoes, the starches. And you get confused. I, I know you do, and you get upset with yourself. You blame yourself for what's going on. Because what you do is you sit down to a plate of food and you eat this great big plate of food. I remember doing this myself. What do you, uh, I, you know, choosing a great a big plate of meat and dairy and oil and eating that plate of food and not feeling satisfied at all. Not even noticing that first plate. But that was eating carbohydrate deficient foods. And I'd say to myself, I, you need to eat another plate of food. And so I, I did. I, I picked up another plate of filled it stack, stacked it high of these carbohydrate deficient foods. And I ate that plate and I felt something different. I now, I now felt a bit of mechanical fullness in my stomach, but I was still ravenously hungry. And so I get my carbohydrate deficient foods chew and swallow, I got my signals that it was time to stop eating. I was now in pain and overstuffed. And I may have thought of, of myself, and I know many of you do, there must be something wrong with me. I, I just ate and I'm still hungry. There, I, must, I, must have an, I must suffer from being an obsessive compulsive overeater. I got a psychiatric illness. I just saw myself eat the food and I'm still rather hungry. If I could find room for one more pork chop, I'd have stuck it in. You even go to the psychiatrist because you have an eating disorder. You think there's something wrong with you. 
What's wrong is the foods you chose to satisfy your hunger drive, you chose foods, the meat, the dairy, and the oils, which offer virtually no satisfaction. So if you want to cure your obsessive compulsive reading and your eating disorder, you don't need to see a psychiatrist. You just need to change the foods on your plate to high carbohydrate foods. All right, let's talk about something that you most likely remember. There was a time when this was very popular. It's still true today. Uh, it's the set point theory. Uh, the set point theory is uh, based upon people satisfying the hunger drive. And the set point is the body configuration they end up with. The, the set point is a way of preserving your self-image. Uh, you, you, you meet people, you don't want to see them one time uh, stealth thin and the next time robust. It'd be disturbing to them and to you. So people end up having a particular set point as far as their uh, physical appearance is concerned. I, I remember that the time I've heard about the set point theory and learned about it, I was working at St. Lena Hospital running my program there. And I, I'd walk through the halls and I'd see the bald guy collecting the money who was overweight and for 16 years, I'd walk by his window and he was still the same overweight, bald guy for those 16 years. And I walked further down the hall and I'd see a, a trim secretary and I watched her for 16 years too. And she didn't change her physical appearance. She had a set point. The belief is that our bodies have a preset weight base hardwired into our genetics. If it's hardwired into your genetics, you can't change it, can you? Because you can't change genes. You can't change your heredity. So fortunately, that's not, well, it's only partially true. There's a bit of truth to that, but it's, it's not useful information because you can't do anything about it. You're condemned, if you believe that, to being overweight, having a set point of an overweight person, or being trim or too trim. Uh, let's look at some examples of people that I've had a chance to observe during a large part of their career and, and remember what they looked like. And notice that they were never hungry and their set point remained the same throughout their career, which may have spanned uh, 50, 60 years. Like Catherine Hepburn, as a young woman, she was trim, healthy looking, and so she was during the latter part of, latter part of her life. Uh, some of you remember uh, Jackie Gleason, in fact, uh, his caricature was uh, one of an obese man. In fact, they, they made cartoons of him being obese. Uh, he was never hungry. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock, there's another example. And again, they did caricatures of him that showed him as an obese man. Never hungry, but he had a set point. President Obama is a good example. A trim, healthy guy, our 44th president, weighed 175 pounds, six foot two. Maintained the same physical appearance uh, way back when, and even today. In fact, you'll see a, a video of him uh, if you search for it, uh, given in 2008 when he was a senator, talking about the advantage of vegan diets. You know, our 44th president knew the importance of a vegan diet. In fact, I might say he learned it in part from me. Uh, I was a, a, a teacher at Punahou High School. Uh, I gave presentations intermittently and, and I remember him attending at least two of the presentations. Now, why do I remember Barry Obama in Punahou High School in Hawaii? Well, how do I? Well, because he was the only black boy, young man in that audience. Everybody else was either white or Asian. He stood right out, and I'll tell you, after my lectures, this young man would come out and pursue me, walk me out to my car, asking questions. Anyway, if um, you want to read more about the relationship I had in the past with Barry Obama, uh, it's uh, a newsletter I wrote, which you can find in the bottom right-hand corner. Our 45th president, uh, he has a particular set point. He weighs 244 pounds, he's six foot three. And most of you know what his diet was. He was never hungry, but he maintains this set point by satisfying his hunger drive. So how do we change this set point? Can't change our genes. There is a way. 
modern examples, Taylor Swift uh, drinking a Coke here and exercising. She says that's the way she maintains her, her youthful appearance. And I assume if she continues the same eating habits, she'll continue to be that way until old age. Lizzo. Lizzo has a particular set point. It happens to be a very overweight woman. And, you know, and she's trying to become a vegan. And she talks about being a vegan from other points of view besides personal appearance. But she's making attempts. And she's very much in favor of eating a vegan diet. And she does sometimes. I know sometimes. And even a healthy diet, she eats sometimes because one of her favorite foods is Dr. McDougall's right food cups. She likes this one best. If she ever gets serious about what she eats, she'll change her set point. Not with just one cup a day or two cups a day from Dr. McDougall. These animals, all animals, have a set point. They're never hungry, or they shouldn't be. The food's available in their environment. And have you ever seen an over, over, overweight or obese giraffe or elephant or hippopotamus or elk or gorilla? No, never, ever. Well, almost never, ever. It's because they eat the diet intended for each and every one of these animals. But we can change the set point on our animals too, by feeding them table scraps, by changing their diet. And we can change their physical appearance quite drastically to the point where it's been called animal abuse. One of the set points that is well recognized throughout history uh, in art and literature is a set point of people who are aristocrats, the kings and queens of old. Uh, they were pictured as being overweight or obese, uh, suffering from gout. And they had diabetes and arthritis and all kinds of problems. And uh, th this, is, this has been something that's been recognized by, by people for, well, for thousands of years, is that rich people who eat rich food, end up sick with the diseases that we suffer from in this country, and being overweight. They had atherosclerosis. I mean, the mummies did 4,000 years ago from Egypt. You look at, uh, at the, uh, the preserved bodies of these royalty, uh, the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, and you study their bodies, you, you find that they have terrible atherosclerosis, and some are obese, and they have gallbladder disease, and they have deformities of their children neurotube defects that are caused by eating the Western diet. And, and these are people, by the way, who exercised a lot, got plenty of sunshine, never smoked cigarettes. It's just that they ate differently. The kings and queens, the pharaohs, the priests, the aristocrats, uh, they ate the animal foods. Whereas the people who built the pyramids, toiled in the fields, they ate starch-based diets. Well, some of that starch was fed to to pheasants and sheep and cows and pigs. And then the royalty ate the cows and pigs and other animals and got sick and overweight. And so it is with our society today. In high income countries, obesity is prevalent. And among the poor, they are still trim. Why? Because of their diet. You can still see that today. And not only obesity, they develop other diseases of, influence, of affluence, heart disease, diabetes, cancers, et cetera. It should be clear to you why people are in trouble around the world. It's because they can now afford to eat and do a diet that was once reserved for aristocrats. Because of uh, the harnessing of fossil fuels and, and the... Uh, industrial revolution and the technology and transportation, et cetera, that we've developed, we can feed half the population of planet Earth a diet that was once reserved for royalty. And we do. Over half the people on this planet suffer from Western diseases. So how do you change your set point? Well, one way is to exercise. You've seen this. You've seen friends who are overweight who go out and decide to train for a marathon and they get trimmed. They're never hungry. They don't want me to eat as much as they want. But they burn the calories off through strenuous exercise. And as long as they continue that pattern, if it's a lifelong pattern of exercising, you know, almost daily, they're going to maintain a trim weight. So there's a way to change your set point. 
just get a bunch of exercise. But I have to, I have to say to you, that's that's something that takes some effort and something you have to build into your daily regime. But there's another way to change your set point, and it's one you can do permanently and never be hungry. And that's to change what's on your plate. And, and that's the whole theme of this lecture is to get you to change that set point by changing the food you eat. If you're gonna eat high fat, high meat, high refined foods, uh, you're gonna end up with a high set point. You're gonna fall into that category where 80% of people in our population are overweight or obese. If you eat the foods that we recommend, which are the plate on the right, you're gonna lose weight effortlessly, always and permanently, as long as you eat these kinds of foods, never fails. Well, may temporarily in those who overshoot by being hungry and starving and having memory of, of starvation for a short time until your body adjusts. There are no overweight people who eat starch-based diets. You've seen this. You know, some of you are old enough to remember before the 1980s, before 1980 in China, 2 billion people. There was no type 2 diabetes. And there was no obesity. And 90% of their food came from white rice. Some of you are even older. You remember the newsreels that uh, came during the Vietnamese conflict. I do. There'd be people in a town square, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000 people. Nobody was overweight living on rice-based diets. You can still see this in North Korea today, except for Kim Jong-un. He, he, he switched to the richest of the rich in the Western diet. You see what's happened. Whereas the rest of the population in North Korea is trim and healthy and active, uh, disregard the political things that are going on. See what the difference in the food has caused. Right there, you can see it one country. So if you want to ch permanently change your set point, you can. But the only way you can do it is by, or effortlessly do it, is by eating different kinds of foods. You've got to eat something you have to do. You don't have to exercise it you know, to maintain a long life and good health. But you do have to eat. And that's something that you can easily substitute. And you can change yourself. And it always works. All right. Uh, dieting means hunger. That means pain. And as we've discussed, uh, you, you, can, you can suffer from the overshoot phenomenon. Uh, there's a, 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 a practice that actually was a popular when I was a young doctor, it was called uh, Fletcherization or Fletcherism. And it was based upon a philosophy by Horace Fletcher. And what he believed is that you could lose weight by chewing your food. And he recommended that you chew your food 32 times based upon the fact that there are 32 teeth in the mouth of an adult. But people who practice uh, Fletcherization, they would chew their food 50 to 100 times until it turned into liquid, until it swallowed itself. You know, that does work, by the way. This excessive chewing has been tested. And they had people chew their food excessively or more than usual. And they weighed 12% less than those who had less chewing going on scientifically studied. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a practice that I think you'll find hard to commit yourself to. But it's a way of distracting away from the hunger drive, the pain of hunger. Uh, famous diet, the Hollywood grapefruit diet. And there have been many similar diets that restrict calories. And so something, something miraculous about a particular formula somebody puts together and and, and tries to sell you, there's some magic in it. And the magic turns out to be in this case that they're feeding you 800 calories a day. You know, a woman may take in 1,800, 2,000 calories, a man 2,400 to 3,000 calories, and they're feeding you 18, 800 calories a day. And as a result, you lose weight, as do many of these programs. Still hurts being hungry. Dieting means hunger. Even if you chew the food many times, even if you follow a calorie-restricted diet, it still hurts. 
And we have all kinds of programs that work along the same philosophy. They restrict your calories to about what these uh, conscientious objectors ate during the Minnesota starvation experiment. Uh, 1,200, 1,500 calories a day, sometimes a few more. And these are popular programs that many of you are familiar with. They're Overeaters Anonymous, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers News System, and many, many others. I have a whole list of them I put down at the bottom of the slide, and there are more to come. But they're all based on the same thing, and that is make, making you hungry by not feeding you enough food, even though they may provide the food for you. You're still hungry. You're still in pain. You're still suffering. A hungry person can only see food. Oh, and then we have the extreme of being hungry. And this actually happened when I was a young doctor living in Hawaii. We had a fellow that went around the country and possibly around the world giving lectures on being a breathitarian, a breathitarian. Uh, and this is based on some Buddhist and Hindu beliefs that you can live on only air. You know, you get all your calories, all your protein, all your vitamins, all your minerals just by breathing. And he claimed that he never ate food and he ran lectures, uh, which are $10 a lecture and $100 for the whole program. This was fine until the uh, front page of the Honolulu Advertiser, which appears here, tells you a story of this man. He was caught going to 7 Eleven buying Twinkies and brownies and other snack foods and eating them in secret. But he was on the ultimate low-calorie low diet if he followed his practice, wasn't he? All right. Uh, there are some things that we practice today. Well, some have truth to them, some not so much. But uh, things that distract from hunger, but also increase metabolic activity, in other words, burning calories. And I'd like to talk to you about a few of those um, caffeinated drinks, tobacco, coffee, and various types of injections. Uh, here, here's, here's, here's some methods that I, I found kind of interesting on how to get your trim by doing things like wearing uh, insulated pants and it burns calories. So that's the way to get trim. And so you have all kinds of wear that you can buy and clothing that increases calorie expenditure and you lose weight. Nonsense. Or uh, you can, uh, I, I remember the, uh, the weight belts that they used to use that vibrate your body fat and doesn't work either. And uh, they would uh, stretch you out and heat you up. And they even, they even had soaps that you could wash yourself with and it would uh, cause you to lose fat. Well, at least these programs didn't do any harm. You were still hungry though. And you didn't lose any weight Not from these methods. Let's, let's, let's talk about, um, let's, let's talk about, uh, Coca-Cola for a minute. And uh, this is an actual commercial from 1961. And it talks about the benefits of consuming Coke as far as weight loss is concerned. You know, this was me five years ago, and it's still me. As I confess, at least I'm not just way back. Well, that's enough for today. Now for a lively lift. Ice cold Coca Cola. There's no waistline worry with Coke, you know. Actually, this individual size bottle has no more calories than half a grapefruit. Mmm, another thing the cold, crisp taste of Coke is so satisfying, it keeps me from eating something else that might really add those pounds. Coke's a natural. Wholesome blending of pure food flavors. I guess that's why everyone likes the refreshing new feeling you get, only from not too sweet Coca Cola. And no wonder. Lively, lifty Coca Cola provides a welcome bit of quick energy between meals. Thanks for a pleasant pause in a busy day. Oh, and remember, Coke is low in calories, too. Hey, now, don't you get any thinner? There's truth to what Connie says. And, uh, this commercial, um, I discovered at the same time the dairy industry was telling you that you should consume dairy to lose weight. The dairy products are high fat. Milk is 50% fat. Cheese is 70% fat. Butter is 100% fat. And yet they tell you that 
consuming dairy is the secret to weight loss. Look to your refrigerator is what they say for milk. That's what the dairy industry is teaching. And compare that to consuming Coca-Cola. No fat in Coca-Cola. The fat you eat the fat you wear. And carbohydrate satisfies the hunger drive. And Coke is a full of carbohydrate. It happens to be simple sugars. You know, compare the calorie concentration of uh, a glass of milk compared to a, a glass of cola. And what you find out is uh, dairy products have twice as many calories. So uh, the truth is in this commercial is that Coke is not health food. You know, watch your teeth, raise your triglycerides, but actually would be a beverage that would cause you to lose weight. And more so than if you believe the dairy industry's commercials. But smoking cigarettes, uh, smoking cigarettes uh, and advertise that the way to get trimmed to lose that excess weight is to use tobacco. But it's a truth to that smoking cigarettes makes you ill at a certain level. You lose some of your hunger, right? And yeah, it does work. But of course, I don't have to talk to you about the destructive damage that's done from cigarette smoking. A uh, coffee. Now, coffee increases metabolism. Uh, any caffeine uh, beverage it increases metabolism, it burns calories, but it does something else. Coffee uh, is effective at suppressing the appetite. So there's another way to lose weight with, um, unfortunately, bad habits. This uh, is a placebo. And the reason I mention it is uh, when I met Mary 50, 52 years ago, uh, she was working in a doctor's office as a nurse that gave women shots, primarily women, there were probably a few men. Uh, they were HCG shots. And this is a, a human chorionic gonadotrope, HCG, which is a hormone produced during pregnancy. Of course, they made it in the laboratory. They didn't just get it from pregnant women, but that's where it comes from. Is from uh, uh, they collected the urine of pregnant women. And what uh, she would do is she administer shots uh, once or twice a week and then put them on a 500 calorie diet. Well, scientific evidence shows that ACG shots are at best placebo. You know, they're not harmful except to your pocketbook, but this is another way of distracting you from your hunger. Some uh, miracle benefits are offered you by giving you a little pain from a poke from a needle once or twice a week. Uh, there have been many what I would call placebo programs out there that uh, and I've told you there's a miracle way of losing the excess weight and not being hungry. Not true. Like the lemonade diet of lemon juice and maple syrup and water. Again, these are all programs that were pop popular when I was a young doctor, and that's why I share them with you. Uh, low carbohydrate diets like the Atkins diet and the keto diet, uh, they reduce the hunger drive. But they do it in a way that you know, they shouldn't be proud of, but they seem to be. They tell you that these low-carb diets reduce your appetite. And they do. This is the ultimate in uh, low-carb programs. It's uh, a, a diet. It's called the last chance diet. And it's the ultimate low-carb diet. So it was popular back in the uh, early 70s. And what they did is they fed you a, a formula, a drink that was made of products from the slaughterhouse. They uh, took the crushed bones, horns, hides, and tendons, and from the, the leftover from the slaughterhouse and ground them up and put them in a bottle, sold it to you as prolin. And that's how you were to lose weight. And you did lose weight on this kind of program. It made you so sick. In fact, it made people so sick that 58 people suffer from a heart attack, but 20, 22 to 4 million people tried this kind of weight loss. It shows you how desperate they are. It did reduce the hunger drive. The, the popular low-carb diets, uh, they started with a guy named uh, William Banting. He was a funeral director, which is a very appropriate occupation for somebody that's dealing with a diet that makes you sick and kills you. What better job do you can have? but uh, be a funeral home director and prescribe a low carbohydrate diet. And that's what he did. And he lost uh, 35 pounds and, you know, the first year and uh, a lot more over 50 pounds uh, during his lifetime. Wrote a book called The Letter of Corpulence. And this was the forerunner of the Atkins diet and the keto diets. 
the keto diets. You know, that's what's popular now. And uh, the uh, brain grain diet and uh, Barry Sears' own diet. There are a whole bunch of variations of these diets who claim that they work this marvelous miracle by putting you to a bliss state of ketosis. You should look forward to going into ketosis because then the diet works. And they even call them keto diets this way. They don't even disguise how they work. Ketosis. Ketosis occurs when you don't have enough carbohydrate in your body by eating or storing it. What happens is the body has to resort to a second class fuel, which is fat. When you run out of the carbohydrate, you're not eating carbohydrate anymore and you've spent your glycogen stores. In other words, the stores of sugar in your muscles and your liver. When you run out of that, what the body has to do is it has to have something to stay alive. And so it burns fat and it stays alive. But one of the results of being in ketosis is you lose your appetite. It makes you sick. Naturally, ketosis occurs under two circumstances in the mind. One is if you're starving to death. You know, say you're in a population of people and there's no food available due to drought or war, and you're starving to death. The first about three days are extremely painful. You're suffering from semi-starvation. You, you haven't gone into ketosis yet. And if that kind of pain continued, you'd be hampered from figuring out how to get out of trouble. But instead, in about two to four days, you go into a state of ketosis where the body burns fat and releases ketones as a byproduct, and the ketosis suppresses the hunger drive. In this case, after two to four days of suffering, you go into ketosis, you can think about something else. You can think about getting yourself out of trouble. The other time you go into ketosis is when you're ill, very ill for a long period of time. You may, it may have happened to you, I suspect so, when you had a bad flu. What happens after a couple of days is you lose your appetite. You go into ketosis. Why? Because you're supposed to be recovering. You're not supposed to be gathering and preparing food. You're supposed to be healing. And so the body goes into a state of ketosis during severe illness. That's one of the reasons I call it the make yourself sick diet. There are other reasons we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So when the keto people tell you that you have a decreased appetite when you eat their kind of program, it's because you're so sick, you don't want to eat. Well, I, I wrote an article about this, published in uh, Mayo Clinics and brings out some, uh, some special points to patients and physicians. There was an article published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings talking about not only does a low-carb diet cause you to lose weight, but it's also good for your health because it lowers your blood pressure, lowers your blood sugar, and lowers your cholesterol levels. Everybody knows these particular risk factors are associated with more heart disease. Well, that's not the only way that doctors can lower the cholesterol, the cholesterol patients and blood pressure and blood sugar. Cancer chemotherapy works as well. You put somebody on a cancer chemotherapy regime, they get sick, they get nauseated, they lose weight, blood pressure comes down, their blood sugar comes down, their cholesterol comes down. But what doctor would write about a loss program based upon cancer chemotherapy, I ask? Let's put it in perspective. Both regimes are make yourself sick regimes. Well, there's been uh, several review papers uh, that have published, and this is where you look at a whole bunch of studies and you come to conclusions. And each one of these review papers, which you have a reference to, you can look it up, it shows that consuming low carb diets increase your risk of disease and death. All four reviews dealing with dozens and dozens of studies they all have come to the same conclusion, that if you eat these kinds of diets, you will be sick and a higher risk of having heart disease and death. So I call them the make yourself sick diets, not just because they make yourself sick initially, but because over the long term, you're sick with very severe chronic diseases that will kill you. 
I want to point out there are no, no studies that show that high carbohydrate diets have similar effects, even though they lower cholesterol, blood pressure, blood pressure and they make you healthy and, and lose the weight. And there was just a meeting last month. There was a, a meeting that was published on CNN News. I read it yesterday about how they had come to the conclusion, these group of doctors and cardiologists, big meeting, maybe this will change the way many doctors talk about these low carbohydrate diets that have shown research that shows that these kind of diets increase your risk of having heart disease. But this is old news and not new news. You know, I've, I've re reviewed the studies for 40 years that show the same thing. We, we've known that eating a diet full of bacon, butter, and cheese gives you heart disease and strokes and other problems, including cancer. Uh, hospitals even get into the business. You know, hospitals are supposed to be associated with better health, aren't they? They're not. You know, people think of hospitals, they think about sickness. They don't think about getting healthy in a hospital. Rightly so. Not only do hospitals, by and large, not deal with the underlying cause of chronic disease. In other words, you won't go to a hospital and have the food service feed you a diet that will cause you to recover. They feed you the same foods that brought you to the hospital in the first place. That's what they do in hospitals. Well, they've gone one step further. They've sold a liquid version of these low carb diets. Why? To make a ton of money, like Optifast. Doctors promote this. These, these diets have a very serious side effects and 95% of people lose weight, gain it back because you can't stay on these diets. Even insurance companies won't pay for them. Yet they still sell them. Not as popular as they were, say, 10, 20 years ago in hospitals. All right, we're dealing with the hunger drive still, and we've got to have other ways to deal with the hunger drive. You know, we've, uh, we've talked about just uh, ignoring it and staying hungry or trying to distract yourself from hunger. Uh, we've talked about uh, low-carb diets that, that make you sick and reduce your hunger drive. Let's talk about drugs for a minute. There are a couple of categories of drugs that I want to talk about. Uh, one are uh, ones that release uh, catecholamines, like amphetamine, and uh, they suppress the hunger drive. Or, or there are drugs that are used to treat opioid addicts. Okay, And as, as, a, as a result of the effects of these drugs, they take, you know, these drugs take away pain, right? They take away the pain of hunger. So some of them cause you to lose weight. And then the other category, and we're going to talk about this separately, are the new popular drugs, Wigovi, Ozempic, semaglutide, that's a category, or liraglutide is, is another category of these drugs. Very popular these days. So let me give it the attention it deserves in just a moment. Uh, there are four FDA-approved drugs for weight loss, which deal with suppressing the hunger drive and increasing metabolism by feeding things like amphetamines or fenfen. Do you remember fenfen? It was a popular weight loss drug maybe 15, 20 years ago. And they took that on them off the market because it caused, this, caused heart valve disease, which you know, was very serious when your heart valves become damaged. So they took fenfen off the market and, and amphetamines are off the market because they're abused. But they cause you to lose weight, both, both products do. But there are still four drugs on the market and we're gonna talk about those that, um, that are allowed by the FDA to be sold. And uh, here are the categories of drugs that uh, we're gonna talk about in a little more detail in a moment. As far as weight loss goes, if you compare the percent of weight loss over 12 months, you can see how effective they are. And you can see how much cost they cost. Like uh, placebo, you don't change your diet at all. You don't lose any weight. It costs you nothing. And uh, some of the appetite suppressing drugs and the metabolism increasing drugs, uh, they, you lose maybe 6.8% or 4% of your body weight. Consuming Oralistat, which I'm going to give some attention to in just a minute, uh, not much, you don't lose much weight, 2.9% of body weight, and what does it cost? $512 a month. The, uh, the uh, new drugs, you know, the Ozempic, and Wigovi, these kind of drugs, they, they cause better weight loss, and that's why they're popular today. 
Uh, they cause uh, between 5% and 8% loss of your body weight. But look what they cost. This is a month, $1,000, $1,400 a month. That's the cost. And of course, then there's, uh, then there's doing the right thing. That's eating the diet that suppresses the hunger drive, the diet for human beings. Weight loss is between 5 and 10%, 11% in a month. Cost you nothing. All right, let's talk about uh, the new popular drugs. Everybody's talking about them. You know, you know, this, all your friends want to be on them. They can't afford it, Phil. And uh, what they say is they make your body more, burn more calories and crave less food. That's, what, that's what, how they do the pitch. But uh, they, they cause the brain to re crave less food. And that can happen in uh, many ways, including the way that it really works. Uh, they're categorized as... Uh, glucagon-like peptide agonists, GLP-1. And they, uh, <clears throat> they are agonists, and they uh, simulate a natural hormone in your body, which is GLP-1. And as a result, it's supposed to reduce appetite, releases insulin, increases uh, satiety, leading to weight loss. And that's, that's the way it's sold, that's the pitch. All the studies published, Without exception, all, all does mean that without exception, doesn't it? All the studies published are by one pharmaceutical company or another. There's no independent research done on these. Well, let's talk about uh, where these uh, GLP-1 agonists come from. They come from the poisonous, poisonous venom of an amphibian that lives in the Southwest United States, called the Gila monster. In uh, the lower jaw of the Gila monster is produced a venom, a venom that is as toxic as a diamondback rattlesnake. Uh, the consequence of being bit by one of these little reptiles, they're only about a couple of feet long, is uh, swelling, tense burning. That's a local reaction that you get from the bite on your skin. But you get systemic reactions, and one of them is vomiting and weakness. You know, so these are side effects similar to the, the bite that you get from the needle from the doctor or from the pharmaceutical company by taking these agonist drugs. Helium monster poisoning, that's what it is, ladies and gentlemen. It's helium monster poisoning. Uh, here are some of the, the products. Govi, the Velsus, those are the semaglutides. And then there's the Leerglutides, uh, which are Bictosin. These kinds of drugs are, are injected, most of them. We, Govi can be given as pill. And uh, the weight change is uh, as high as 16% with the semaglutides and uh, a little over 6% uh, with the uh, Leerglutides. But the gastrointestinal adverse effects, 84% of people have GI disturbance. This is what's reported, 84% with the semaglutides and 83% uh, with the lyroglutides. Take a look at this. But you also have to adhere in all these studies to a diet that asks you to consume 500 fewer calories. And they tell you to exercise. So it's a combination of, of the effects of the drug and a calorie-reduced diet and getting exercise. Uh, the major side effects, uh, and this is what's listed by the company, are nausea, diarrhea, decreased appetite, vomiting, constipation, indigestion, stomach pain, you know, in some reports, up to half of the people report nausea. This means they report nausea. It's bad enough so they tell the investigators that they're nauseated or they vomited. How about all those people who aren't quite that sick, but they're still sick? They're sick enough to suppress their appetite, but not sick enough to report to the investigator that they have nausea or vomiting. How about those people? 
Anyway, there are a whole bunch of other serious adverse effects uh, like pancreatitis, and low blood sugar and allergic reactions. And some of these drugs give you kidney problems and there's even damage to your vision, gallbladder problems. Now, what the scientific studies that are paid for by the drug industries, they try and paint a rosy picture. And so they bring in highbrow science to tell you, they don't mention that the reason that you lose weight is because you're too sick to eat. They tell you it's because it slows gastric pumping, increases gastric volume, and it affects satiety hormones like uh, ghrelin and liptin. But that's um, really scientific and you know, something you might want to try because uh, the scientists just discovered this effect they can have on your metabolism. We have something that we all know about, nausea and vomiting, and causes you not to eat. And they don't want to brag about too much, do they? The primary mechanism of weight loss is the gastrointestinal effects. You're too sick to eat. But these are, remember, what was reported are the people who have enough sickness to, to tell the investigators about it. So it's not the other half of the people who are sick in a subclinical way. It's not bad enough to tell, to report it, or even maybe to register it in their own mind, but they're still sick. Oh, this is a, a report that uh, recently came out, February 27, 2023, in the Western uh, and the uh, Wall Street Journal. I thought this was interesting enough to share with you. From a, a Christian Gale, a radiologist in Honolulu, who quit Wegovy in the summer of 2022. She said the drug left her repulsed by most foods and vomiting nearly every day. Gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, constipation, or diarrhea are common. But, but, the people who make money off the drugs says it's, it's mild in most people. It's not. The way these drugs work is they make you sick. So you've got diets, low carb diets that make you sick, or you can buy medicines that make you sick. She says, at one point I told my husband, I would rather starve than feel this way. I wanted to enjoy food again. This has become big businesses. Uh, it's estimated that uh, this business in 2027 will be, well, somewhere between seven and $17 billion a year business. And as a result, you have clinics, uh, particularly on the internet, that uh, will not only give you a doctor's appointment, but will sell you the drugs. And, and they'll offer you a discount the first month. Maybe they'll give it to you for $600 for the first month, uh, throw in an office visit and so on. Then they start charging the $1,400 a month. Big business. Uh, they've, got, they've got a new one coming out. I just want you to, you to be aware of it. It's uh, Manjaro. And uh, it results in even more weight loss than we go view. Or, uh, or, or Zambi. Or Zambi. And, uh, you know, 18% weight loss, still the same side effects. What would you expect? But that's going to be the new one that they're promoting to you as soon as they get FDA approval. What happens is a couple of things that I want to point out to you by taking this medication, this kind of medication, these GLP-1 agonists, is look at the rate of weight loss. Uh, this, this is the percent of weight loss uh, over several months. How many months? Uh, 68, 68 months, excuse me, 68 weeks. 68 weeks, which is uh, well, 17 months. Anyway, uh, the, the percent of weight loss, as you see there, you carry it out to 68 weeks. Is, uh, well, they report 16, 17. You, maybe you can read it as 18% weight loss. That's not a lot. Okay, uh, not a lot. If, if you started at 233 pounds, which is what the average uh, person in the study started at, their baseline weight, uh, you drop to 196 pounds at a cost of $250 a week. It would cost you to lose that weight, to lose, uh, what is it? Eight, well, it's about 38 pounds. It, you would it would cost you to lose that weight 
over a period of a little longer than a year, it would cost you $17,000. And that might stop you right there. And then you would think, except for the plateau phenomena, excuse me, the plateauing phenomena is what they call it. You stop losing at 68 weeks. You see it right here. They take it out to 104 weeks. They don't lose any more weight. The body's had enough. So you're going to plateau. You're still going to be taking the drug. If you stop taking the drug, you're going to gain the weight back. Plan on it. And you just wasted $17,000 and ended up sick every day of that period of time. That's what they're selling you. And there's another side effect people are talking about. It's, uh, it's uh, called the ozempic face. My body looked great, but my face looked exhausted and old. Well, you know, when, when you lose weight by most methods, you know, dieting, making yourself sick diets, low-carb diets, or taking making yourself sick drugs, you lose weight rapidly. And what happens is the fat disappears from under the skin. And, you know, fat actually smooths off the wrinkles and uh, causes people in some way or another to look younger. So you lose the fat, and now you got skin hanging and more wrinkles and ozempic face. You know, for years, you stretch the skin out by eating the high fat diets and being overweight. And now all of a sudden you, you take the fat away and the skin hangs. Well, they can treat that. Yeah, you know, you, you can go to the plastic surgeon. They can treat that. They can use fillers, which cost you five to $10,000. They could do deep plane in facelift, which is $75,000 $75, for the facelift. Or they do tra fat transfers. They suck fat from one area of your body, so your buttocks, the thigh, and shove it up into your face with a needle. They can do that. But I want to point out to you that if you lose weight, uh, the right kind of diet, a high starch diet, you don't suffer from a, a worse appearance. You actually gain a healthier appearance with a improved complexion. You increase the circulation throughout your body, including your face, and you develop something that's referred to as in the pink. Here. By losing weight on the kind of diet that I recommend to you. you know, consider that as an opposing reason that you should change your diet to the right kind of eating. All right. Uh, let's go on to another way that's popular of losing weight. And that's by uh, uh, rearranging the intestinal tract. Uh, that's by creating malabsorption by, uh, by fillers, reductions, and bypasses. And uh, you lose weight. Yeah, you do. Uh, it's reserved for people who are really obese. You know, they've got to be 39.9 kilograms, which are 39.9%, which is, or, you know, they're morbidly obese people that undergo this. And there are some benefits to this. Just just like with, with any program that causes you to lose weight, except for the low carb diets. But most programs that cause you to lose weight, when you lose weight, your blood pressure comes down, your blood sugar comes down, your cholesterol comes down, et cetera. So the, these do have some benefits in terms of reducing the risk of dying for these morbidly obese people and heart disease, but look at the way they do it. You know, they, they deal with fillers. Fillers, that, that means they stick balloons in your stomach and blow them up and or have uh, other types of, uh, of objects that they put in the stomach to fill up the stomach so that you, when you eat, you feel, feel full fillers. And then they have reductions where they make your stomach smaller. And they do it in a couple of ways that we're going to talk about. And then they do bypasses of your intestine. Oh, let's talk about one of the original bypass procedures that was uh, very popular. Uh, back in the 1800s and early 1900s. And this was causing malabsorption of the food you ate by infesting yourself with a tapeworm. And that way uh, you bypass the food that you eat, it goes into the tapeworm. So you have less food, so you're still hungry. Initially you satisfy some of the, uh, the hunger drive, but uh, swallowing a tapeworm has been quite popular. In the past. It's been brought up recently by some of the movie stars. They're so desperate, they think of infesting themselves with a tapeworm. There's a guy that pulled out a 32-foot long tapeworm from his intestinal tract. 
how do you get these guys out? And, you know, they used to talk about in the 1800s about taking a, a little piece of bread and some forceps and putting it next to your anus and enticing the tapeworm to come out, and grab them by the neck and pull them out. I don't know whether that worked or not. We have, uh, we have uh, various kinds of drugs that will poison these parasites. The original bypass procedure. All right. Uh, here's another one that was very popular, another bypass procedure. Food, uh, you bypass the food you consume through modern chemistry. And what happens, you take these drugs that inhibit your intestines ability to absorb fat. And so your stools, your intestinal contents are full of oil and fat. And you notice this because you look at the toilet and you see a whole bunch of greasy globules in the toilet and you suffer from problems like anal leakage, uncontrolled diarrhea. You know, when you pass gas, you pass more than gas with these, but they bypass you know, the, the, the calories go out of the body into the toilet. It's a, an original bypass type of procedure. You didn't think about tapeworms and Orlistat as, as bypass procedures, did you? I, I hope I've changed your whole way of thinking. Uh, Al Roker, NBC's weather reporter, very popular guy. And he, he, he shared with us uh, his struggles with weight what he's done at various times to lose weight. In 2002, he underwent gastric bypass surgery. He was over, over, he was over 300 pounds at that time. He lost 100 pounds and bragged about it, of course, showed the public. You know, it's no secret. I'm not violating anybody's trust. Well, he, he developed a problem of binge eating, binge eating disorder. And he started gaining weight back. You see in his picture, he's gained weight back. And so in September of 2018, what did he do? Because the bypass operation wasn't enough. He, like many people who go through the surgery, have figured out how to get calories in. You know, by like by grinding the food and swallowing the, the liquid material. You can get the calories in then. Anyway, what did he have to do? He had to resort to an appetite suppressing regime. He went on a keto diet in September of 2018, he lost 40 pounds. That was his next phase of weight loss. He had, he had to not only use the, the uh, bariatric surgery of rearranging the intestinal tract, he had to resort to a make yourself sick diet. And believe me, I, I have, I, have uh, uh, I hold, I hold a, a belief, a guess that he's going to resort himself to, if he hasn't already, to uh, these semaglutides, you know, Ozembic, Bigovi, and et cetera. It's, it's in his future. And, it, and it's something that he should be considering right now because the low-carb diets have failed him. You know, I, I just took this shot of a uh, recent news broadcast. You see in the last picture, he's gained the weight back. A lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it. So now what is he going to have to do? He's, he's been through you know, a serious intestinal bypass surgery. He's going on a make yourself sick diet. And now he's going to take make yourself me sick medicines. What a tough life this poor man has gone through. Well, binge eating disorders. Uh, you know, I, I run into people who tell me that they gain weight doing anything. And, and I explain to you why you develop a hyperphagia doing as a result of being hungry. The fear of being hungry again causes you to get ready for the next famine. We talked about that during the Minnesota starvation experiment, how the men had a period of hyperphagia and gained 10% more than their original weight. Because of the fear of being hungry, the pain. Well, how, how do you deal with people who have uh, binge eating disorders, who consider themselves volume overeaters? Well, this is the way that I, I deal with such folks. And it occurs in as much as 30% of obese people. Uh, what, we, what I do is, uh, and, and by the way, they, they, not, they gain the weight without purging, a binge eating disorder. A binge eating and purging is the next step where you, you eat and then throw up. This is just uh, eating an excessive amount of food. Um, they say that may be true that they have bigger than normal stomachs and, and they have lower levels of appetite suppressing hormones in their body. I don't know. And again, these are 
sexy scientific explanations why these people have a problem. I think it's better explained that they suffer so much from hunger that they're just taking a natural reaction to get ready for the next famine. Anyway, the solution, the solution, and this works. This is what I've used for, for uh, 47 years of helping people. By the way, I'm a volume overeater. If you didn't recognize the picture there, here I am at a typical meal that I would consume. Typical Thanksgiving dinner. Well, what you do is you have to slow down in your eating. You got to give time for your stomach to register with your brain. If you're putting in food so fast that you're not getting the calories transferred to the bloodstream, which produce hormone changes that let your brain know that it's eaten. You eat too fast. You, you, you haven't given this time that it requires for the registration to occur. And so what you do is you slow down in your eating. And uh, one way to deal with it is you become a, a nibbler as opposed to a, a gorger. You become a nibbler or a grazer. You eat 17 times a day as opposed to one, two, or three times a day. That's one way to do it. But one way you might think about it in practical terms is get yourself a plate of food that you would consider the size of a plate of food that your trim, healthy friends and relatives eat. Get yourself a medium-sized plate of food. Sit down and eat it. Get up and go do something else for a half an hour, an hour. And if you're still hungry, come back and have another medium-sized plate of food. That's the way you deal with binge eating disorder or the volume overeater. You should just ask him to slow down a little bit. This works for my patients. All right, so let's talk about these surgeries again. They're called bariatric surgeries. They still leave you ravenously hungry, just like Al Rourke broke her. He, he's still hungry. He's been hungry all his life, post-bypass surgery. You know, he, he, it doesn't take away the hunger. You, you're still just as hungry and, and maybe worse. And uh, when you have these uh, surgeries because of uh, the post-surgery hunger, half the people regain some weight by 24 months. They gain weight back. The costs, seven to $33,000 in insurances. Pay for it now. They didn't pay for it back when I first started taking care of people who went through these surgeries. Uh, they cause uh, deficiencies in nutrients. And so they're encouraged to eat in addition to the limited amount of foods they, they eat. They're, they're encouraged to, uh, first of all, they're encouraged to eat the McDougal type foods. When people come in and complain about being hungry after their surgeries, what do they tell them to eat? They tell them to eat potatoes and other starches. That's the advice given by, by doctors who are in this business. But they also put you on a vitamin pill, which is unnecessary. Not if you eat the right kind of foods. The diet that we recommend, a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, is the most nutrient-dense of all diets. That's more of the necessary nutrients. And by the way, you know that protein and calcium are not necessary nutrients. There's no, there's been no such thing as protein or calcium deficiency ever. It's never been reported. But scurvy has, iron deficiency has, folic acid deficiency has, et cetera. Well, you're eating a diet except for the B12 that is more nutrient dense than any other diet out there. These are effective too. You know, I told you they reduce the risk of heart disease. They also they reduce the, uh, uh, the cure, not just reduce, they cure type two diabetes in nearly 80% of the cases because of the weight loss. Anything that causes weight loss cures type two diabetes. Whether you wire your teeth together, you go on a low carb diet or low calorie diet, or you have bypass surgery, bariatric surgery, you're gonna resolve type two diabetes in almost 100% of the cases. And this is the evidence that I provide for you when I say type two diabetes is 100% curable on the McDougall diet with associated weight loss. 100% cure. All right, popular procedure, gastric banning, which is restricting the size of your stomach. 
what they do is they put an inflatable band that's connected to a pump under your skin. And you tell the doctor, hey, doc, I'm not losing enough weight. Well, we'll just pump this, this uh, lap band a, a little higher, a little tighter, and we'll cause a smaller volume in your stomach. And you lose weight, but you'll suffer more. You still be hungry, you'll be ravenously hungry, you're suffering more. Doesn't cause malabsorption, just causes restriction. Another way that's popular these days is uh, laparos laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. In other words, they cut part of your stomach out and throw it away. Call a sleeve, works. Still hungry though, you're still ravenously hungry. You haven't done anything to satisfy that, not much. You've filled the stomach with, you know, you've caused some a local effect by filling a smaller stomach, but it doesn't give you the central effect. You know, the registration that occurs in your brain that tells you you've eaten, stop eating. Uh, Ruin Y gastric bypass surgery. This is uh, one of the most invasive, uh, serious, uh, dramatic insults on the human body that occurs. But what, what they do is they uh, take your um, esophagus and a little bit of your stomach and they isolate the stomach out and most of the small intestine. And they, they connect this little piece of stomach, which is attached to your gut esophagus, to the end of the small intestine. Uh, so that the, uh, the part of the body that absorbs the food, the small intestine, is isolated out of the flow of food. It's extremely effective at weight loss. You're still ravenously hungry. You know, it's gotten to the point where just recently, in February of 2023, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been recommending both the drugs and the surgeries to children. Uh, they say that it's okay to take obese kids that are age 12 and older and to give them these uh, GLP-1 agonists. That's right, children. And, and if you're 13 years or older, you can undergo bariatric surgery. What have we done to our children? We allow them to become obese and sick, and then we subject them to these drugs and surgeries to children. I want to point out to you something I learned a long time ago. And that is civilized societies protect their children. Above all, they protect their children. What are we doing? And what they, what they said in their advertisements for the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation is they say obesity is not a lifestyle problem. It's not a lifestyle disease. It is predominantly emerges from biologic factors. In other words, it's your fault. You have bad genes, bad metabolism. It has nothing to do with food, nothing to do with exercise has everything to do with something we can't change, except by giving drugs or cutting out part of your intestine. All right, the problem's the food. The problem is the food. You don't stand a chance, and neither do our children. They don't stand a chance because pretty much all that's available, particularly to children, are fast food items. Look what IHOP does to make you happy as a consumer. They want to give you as many calories, uh, as much food as possible for the least money possible. That's their goal, to get you to buy it. So IHOP stuffs their pancakes with cheese, resulting in just one serving. 1,360 calories uh, that are 36% uh, fat. What, what chance do you have? Remember, you know, a, a, a female woman, maybe, 2,000 calories a man, maybe 2,400 calories a day will satisfy them. You could, if you're active, you could eat more than that, of course. You take in uh, more than half of your daily calorie needs in one single stack of pancakes. Um, Taco Bell. You have, uh, because you're hungry and you're going to eat it all. You're not going to leave any of it uh, on the tray, are you? They feed you uh, 
a particular boxed up meal that uh, has a lot of 150 calories and is nearly 50% fat. They expect you to eat this for lunch or dinner, one serving. Well, you know, if you're hungry, we'll sell you two. A pizza hut. Well, you know, most people I see eat pizza don't just eat one slice. They eat two, three, four, five, six slices. Four slices of pizza hut pizza is 1,240 calories. Uh, McDonald's newest item is the uh, land, sea, and air burger. I'm sure it won't take you much thinking to figure out what they're talking about. They're talking about one layer is beef, land. Another layer is sea, fish. Another layer is air. Yeah, chicken. You got it. 1,300 calories. What chance does a child have of not becoming one of those children who's categorized obese and is put on drugs for the rest of their life or, or goes through surgeries and many of them are alterations in their anatomy. Rich foods make people sick. You know, that, that's how you have to address the problem. Uh, we, even, we even identify some of the products or with names associated with the royalty like Imperial Margin and Dairy Queen and Burger King. We don't even hide the fact that this is rich food. All right, uh, the program that I teach, and you know, I had to get around to telling you about what I think the truth is. And what I practiced for 47 years is the McDougall diet is the right diet. It's the right diet for human beings. It satisfies the hunger drive. And uh, you can, you can make, become a part of this program easily with no cost at all. Just go to our website. We offer a free program. No gimmicks, got recipes, got instructions on doing the program, et cetera. Right there, free, drmcdougall.com. Of course, I would encourage you to come to our 12-day telemedicine internet program where you can get intense help by professional staff. But it's all there for you for free. And foods that are appealing, that you, that you like, that you want to eat, that are even more tasty than the items you get from that fast food restaurant. We have 4,000 recipes published. And, and you can go to Instagram and look under the McDougall category, and you'll find every day people publishing, independent of us, re recipes that they have enjoyed based upon low-fat, starch-based cooking. This is catching on, folks. I am optimistic. I think we're going to win. The truth will win out, I believe. I really do. Uh, we've published three studies showing the effect of, uh, of a, of a, a starch-based diet, high-carbohydrate diet, on weight loss. Uh, we did a seven-day study involving 1,703 people. Uh, this study was performed over a 10-year period of time, an observational study, where we looked at weight loss over a period of seven days, one week, seven days. And the average weight loss was 3.1 pounds in seven days. Some people lost more. Some people lost 12, 16 pounds. Some people gained a couple of pounds. Yeah. But these are our results published without being questioned. You know, we've had no criticism of our work. Independent study of our program was done at Oregon Health and Science University. Totally independent of us, except for the fact that we educated them. You know, they, they gathered participants. Uh, they, they designed the testing. They did follow visits, they collected the data, they published the paper without any input from us, from me in particular. And what, what they show in terms of weight loss was a 19 pound weight loss over a year. You know, the, the saying is, is if you do something for six months, that's a permanent behavior. You know, why do people follow the diet for a year? It's because they, love the food, and they got so many other problems resolved, the weight, the constipation, the indigestion, the blood pressure, the blood sugar, et cetera. Why would you not stick with it? And then the third study was done, again, completely independent, really independent of us. I didn't even know what was going on. It was done in New Zealand. It's called the Broad Study, and they did it in a community, a, a 
people, they asked to follow the McDougal diet. Actually, you read the end of the paper, they followed the McDougal diet. And uh, the weight loss was, uh, well, they brag about them getting the best weight loss of any program in the world. They brag about a weight loss of 25.3 pounds in a year. Why? Because the diet satisfies hunger. Yeah. Uh, this is what happened during the experiment. My investigators, my, particularly my principal investigator, Dr. Yadav, she was shocked when she saw this data when it first came out. The compliance to the diet. What we did is a randomized control trial, the highest quality of any study you can do on food. Random, completely independent of the McDougall program, Mary and I. And what they did is they took a group of people and they divided them into two groups, one a control and one an intervention group. And they analyzed through a food frequency questionnaire, the food intake over a year period of time. And you see the red line there. This is the control group. These are the people that were asked to stay on the typical American diet that they were eating. And you can see they maintained a fat content of about 40% for a year. And people who came to the clinic, the same program we teach now in the 12 day telemedicine internet based program, except you never have to leave your home. And we get a chance to support you in so many other ways, better ways than we did with the live in programs at the hospital or resort. These people dropped their fat intake to fewer than 15% of the calories and maintained it for a year. Permanent changes. 85% of the people were compliant for 12 months. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some examples and these are typical examples, you know, you listen to commercials done by Jenny Craig or Nutrisystems or Weight Watchers. And they show you this uh, uh, usually beautiful person who has wonderful results. In fact, the results you're looking for, and they tell you, look, these results are not typical. Don't expect these results. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you to expect the results that I'm going to show you. These are not the best case scenarios. This is what's going to happen to you. You can count on long-term success because you're never hungry. If people tell me they're hungry on the McDougal diet, the first thing I say is you're not on the McDougal diet. You're not following our philosophy. You know, these are some recent pictures. Uh, we get uh, every week or two, we publish somebody on our website or through our, inner, through our newsletter, uh, Star McDougalers. And so I just picked out a few. Um, like uh, Doug Lerner, you know, he, he exercises. Yeah, he was in the 2020 Olympics, but he lost 140 pounds. He used to be, what, 284 pounds. That's, you couldn't run a marathon at that weight. Anyway, he, he cured his diabetes, went from hemoglobin A1C from nearly 12% to fewer than 6%, which is cure. Dropped his cholesterol 100 points. Bad cholesterol dropped significantly. Blood sugar became normal. He cured his diabetes. As you would expect to happen if you follow the program and you have type 2 diabetes. Look at his picture down in the right-hand corner. What a tough life this poor man had. Had to order a seatbelt extender when he got on an airplane. Couldn't buy clothes in a regular shop. The first thing somebody saw when they, when, when they thought about him is they, look, my goodness, this poor obese man. I'm sure they didn't think, oh, this is, you know, obesity is, uh, is something you should be pleased about, even though there are people like Lizzo who are still trying to tell us that it's good to be fat because she hasn't arrived where she should yet, and she will. I have hope for her. Uh, let's see. Oh, boy, the list is long on what happened uh, to Beth. But, you know, the important things are she's off her medications, her illnesses have been resolved, and her weight loss has been what she needed. She lost 70 pounds. 50 pounds uh, during our pro or after she learned the McDougal program. She says she feels younger than I did this time last year. 
of Thomas uh, McCarthy. These are your typical examples, ladies and gentlemen. This is this is not the best case scenario. This is a scenario you should expect. Now I've got hundreds of pictures to show you. They're all basically the same. He lost 140 pounds, regained his health. The picture says it all. Uh, Fred Ford. Uh, he's an author and speaker. He weighed 350 pounds. Now he's a, a 242. And his goal is 205 pounds, which he expects to, to reach very shortly. You know, he, he started the program in 2021, in March, you know, two years ago. That's what he's, he's accomplished in two years. Lost 23 pounds, dropped her cholesterol. That's what she felt she needed to lose. Uh, Stephanie Douglas. I love the food. I love the program. I love the results. You know, this is why it's so much fun to practice like we do. Uh, we're the happiest staff out there that you can find because true, hap true pleasure in life comes from helping other people. We get a chance to do that every month or two by putting people through the 12 day telemedicine program. Anyway, uh, she had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which she cured. Uh, she suffered terrible when she was in her 30s. Started the diet, it went away as you would expect it to do. 99.99% of people who've ever walked this earth have consumed a starch based diet. Didn't mean they're vegan. I mean, they ate anything they could find. But they lived with the bulk of their calories coming from beans, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, wheat. This is the human diet. That, that's all the McDougal program is trying to teach you, is the human design is correct. And if you nourish it properly, you'll get the results that you should. Uh, let me end this uh, presentation with a challenge for you. This is about hunger. And uh, this will teach you about what hunger means. Something Mary and I did uh, back in the early 80s. In, in the 80s, uh, the headlines captured stories about starving Africans, particularly children. And Mary and I were involved in a congregation which was, was you know, dedicated to helping other people. And my response was, and if you know my personality, you, you have no doubt I did this, is I said, look, let's uh, show some empathy for starving people. Let's go hungry for a weekend. And I got half the congregation to join me. And this was the experience that we all had. And you will have too, if you do this experiment. The Friday evening was no problem at all. I thought, gee, it's just a few hours until we end, uh, we end our hunger with a dinner that we were gonna have on Sunday afternoon. Saturday morning, my thoughts changed to food. I learned that a hungry person only thinks of food. By Saturday evening, I had no more problems. I wasn't worried about uh, marital disputes, problems with my kids, uh, money problems. Every, you want to get rid of all your problems, ladies and gentlemen, you can do it within a day. You'll have only one thought on your mind. Sunday morning, we, uh, you know, if somebody would have given me a ham sandwich, I might have eaten it. I was so hungry. And Sunday afternoon, we enjoyed the best meal we ever had for us who had starved. You want to learn how to eat a starch-based diet and enjoy it? Just go hungry. Best you ever ate. We had green salad, lentil stew, flatbread, and rice. Uh, a meal plan, which is typical of what we eat or recommend to our, our participants, and a typical type of eating that people around the world consume. You want to learn about hunger? You can do it in a weekend. If you're a child or a sick person on medication, don't do this. Otherwise. This is a real learning experience, and you'll understand why you have to resort to programs that make you sick or you suffer from hunger. You can, you can go on low-carb diets or you can take shots that make you sick. Or you can do what's right, which is to eat the diet intended for human beings, and you're never hungry. You love the food. Eat as much as you want. You improve so many aspects of your health, and you're kind to the environment. You make a major step in slowing down global warming. There's no reason not to do it. 
Anyway, the bottom line is you never have to be hungry again. Uh, program's easy to understand. There are many books you can learn from. We have a free program and uh, website to teach you everything you need to know. However, like most people, you need some help. You need to get off your medications. You need some medical advice. You need the support, the encouragement, the education, and the camaraderie of being with other people who eat the same way. It's a very lonely world out there when you know, all your friends and relatives uh, don't have a, the slightest idea of what you're doing or really don't want to know.